Hello, everyone. My name is Tyler Sullivan, and I'm a fourth year medical student at Toro University, California. Welcome back to our four part video lecture series on stroke syndromes. In part one, we covered blood supply and arterial territories in the brain. And here in part two, we'll be covering anterior circulation strokes. So part two, let's start things off with a case. A 75 year old man presents with right sided facial droop, right arm weakness, and difficulty speaking. Part of the CT scan is shown here on the right. So which artery do you think is involved? Middle cerebral artery is the correct answer. As mentioned previously, the middle cerebral artery or MCA for short is part of the anterior circulation. It is the largest branch of the internal carotid artery and the most common path pathologically affected blood vessel in the brain. In this coronal section of the brain, we could see the internal carotid artery coming up and giving off the MCA laterally. This first segment is the M1 segment. The M1 segment gives off lenticulostriate arteries, which ascend upward to supply deeper brain structures such as the caudate nucleus, putamen, globus pallidus, and internal capsule. The M1 segment ends when it bifurcates into two M2 segments, the superior and inferior divisions. On the right, we could see branches of the MCA extending out from the sylvian fissure to supply the lateral frontal and parietal lobes as well as the superior temporal lobe. The next slide is going to cover a complete middle cerebral artery occlusion, which is a blo blockage of the proximal M1 segment right around here. Proximal M1 occlusions yield a classic pattern of symptoms. The most obvious and classic deficit is contralateral hemiplegia and hemianesthesia, which is loss of motor and sensory function on the side of the body that is opposite to the lesion. On the motor and somatosensory homunculus, the MCA covers the face and upper extremity. So we would expect to see weakness and numbness in those areas. The lower extremity is less affected since this is primarily ACA territory. And now a quick note on facial innervation. Here we have the right side of the brain and the left side. Cortical bulbar tracts are upper motor neurons that descend from the cortex and innervate lower motor neurons that reside in cranial nuclei of the brainstem, one of which is the facial motor nucleus of cranial nerve seven, found in the pons. It contains cell bodies of lower motor neurons that then go on to innervate the muscles of the face. The facial motor nucleus has an upper half of the face whose neurons innervate the upper face and a lower half whose neurons innervate the lower face. So let's play this out. In blue are the cortical bulbar tracts that originate in the left hemisphere. They are upper motor neurons that descend from the cortex down to the brainstem where they synapse on both the ipsilateral and contralateral upper face, <laughs> upper half of each facial motor nucleus. And then for the lower facial motor nucleus, they only send fibers to the contralateral side. This pattern is the same on the other side. So in red, we see the cortical bulbar tracts that originate in the right hemisphere. And similarly, they will send fibers to both upper halves of each nucleus on the right side and the left side of the upper half, and then only the contralateral lower half. So the upper face has dual motor neuron supply coming from both sides of the brain and the lower face has a single motor neuron supply coming from the contralateral side of the brain. So let's see what happens with a left MCA stroke. In a left MCA stroke, we lose the blue upper motor neurons from the left hemisphere, which leaves us only with the red fibers from the right hemisphere. These red fibers will innervate the right and left upper face and the contralateral left lower face. However, the sole innervation to the right lower face from the left hemisphere has been lost. Therefore, the deficit from a left MCA stroke will be localized to the right lower face. Unilateral lower facial paralysis by itself tells you there is damage to upper motor neurons somewhere between the cortex and the nuclei in the pons. Unilateral upper and lower facial paralysis tells you there is damage to lower motor neurons somewhere between the nuclei and the facial muscles. 
In MCA strokes, the damage is to the upper motor neurons in the cortex, and only the contralateral lower part of the face will be affected, resulting in facial droop and dysarthria. Eyelid and forehead movements will be intact because the upper half of the face is not affected. This is an important distinguishing feature between an MCA stroke and Bell's palsy, because in Bell's palsy, there is paralysis of both the upper and lower face. So back to the syndrome. This type of stroke may also damage the optic radiations that carry visual information from the eyes to the occipital lobe. This damage may result in contralateral homonymous hemianopia, meaning that the patient will not be able to see out of one half of each eye, specifically the half of the eye that is opposite to the side of the lesion. So here we have a diagram of the visual fields in a right eye and a left eye from the patient's perspective. If this patient had a left-sided lesion, the right half of each eye's visual field would be affected, shown here as dark shading. Additionally, MCA strokes affect the frontal eye fields, which we see here. They're located in the frontal lobe in the posterior part of the middle frontal gyrus. Normally, our eyes are kept centered because of the right and left frontal eye fields being, activating, being activated on the eyes equally. If there is a lesion to one side, you remove the activation from that side and thus the other side dominates. This will make both eyes deviate toward the lesion. So let's see an example. If we have a left frontal eye field lesion, the right frontal eye field will dominate because it's still activated. This will push the eyes towards the left, towards the lesion. And this is called a gaze preference. Here's a real example of the gaze preference that results from a left-sided lesion to the left frontal eye fields. The remaining features of the MCA syndrome depend on whether the lesion is on the dominant side of the brain or on the non-dominant side. For most people, the left side of the brain is the dominant side and the right side is the non-dominant side. In an MCA stroke that affects the dominant hemisphere, both Broca's and Wernicke's areas may be affected. Broca's area is located in the posterior inferior, inferior frontal gyrus and it's involved in speech production, hence the name Broca's motor speech area. When damaged, patients exhibit Broca's aphasia otherwise known as expressive aphasia. These patients have trouble saying words despite them knowing what they want to say. Their speech is non-fluent and broken. And in severe cases, they are only able to speak single word sentences. Wernicke's area is located in the posterior superior portion of the temporal lobe. And it is important for processing sounds so that we can understand them as language. When damaged, patients exhibit Wernicke's aphasia, otherwise known as receptive aphasia. These patients have trouble understanding language. They can speak fluently, but their speech is filled with random words and phrases that don't make sense in a sentence. This has also been described as word salad. When both Broca's and Wernicke's areas are lesioned, as in a proximal M1 segment stroke, the patient may have combined effects producing global aphasia. These patients may only be able to produce and understand a handful of words. Another effect of an MCA stroke on the dominant side is Gerstmann syndrome, which occurs with damage to the posterior lobule of the parietal lobe in the dominant hemisphere, especially the angular gyrus. These patients have trouble with spatial orientation, which manifests as a tetrad of symptoms. The first symptom is acalculia, which is impairment in performing simple calculations. The next is finger agnosia. They can't distinguish between the fingers on their hand. Agraphia, which is a deficiency in the ability to write, and often comes with alexia too. And then you have left-right disorientation, in which the patient can't, dis can't distinguish between the left and right sides of their body. If the MCA stroke is on the non-dominant hemisphere, which is the right side for most, the patient may exhibit anosognosia, 
and hemineglect. Anosognosia is when the patient lacks insight about their neurological deficit. They are unaware of their condition and are unable to accept it. Hemineglect is when the patient seems to ignore a hemisphere of their world, the side opposite of the lesion. They are not aware of items, nor do they respond to stimuli on one side of space. If you ask a patient with neglect to draw a clock, they might just draw half of a clock. These patients have even been known to ignore or disown their own limbs. This is different than hemianopia, which involves problems with the visual system. Hemi neglect is a problem relating to their attention to one side and has nothing to do with the visual system. So that's it for a proximal M1 segment occlusion. Understanding the anatomy relating to these symptoms of a proximal M1 segment occlusion will help make these next few distal MCA syndromes easier to follow. Here are my references for parts one through four. The next video will finish anterior circulation strokes.